Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. It's good to see Pat. Pat's back with us today. After her foot surgery, she's been laid up for a while. It's good to have you, honey. Good to have you back in God's house. I want you to look at one verse and a couple of verses that follow it, but paying particular attention to Romans chapter 12, verse 6. If, if you think that, uh, wait a minute, preacher, you've gone over this before. Yeah, I have, but we're, we're kind of coming back after being out for a couple of weeks uh, from this just traveling through Romans, traveling through the spiritual gifts, and we want to look at it with fresh, uh, fresh heart and, and uh, fresh mind today. So I want you to look at it with me. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, and hear the words. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. He that teaches on teaching, he that exhorts on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Would you pray with me? Father, we do pray for just a few minutes that you'd steal our hearts and our minds. Help us to not think about the things of the world, but Lord, just to think of the things of heaven. Lord, to realize that today as we read your word that you're speaking to us. As we preach your word, Lord, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, Lord God within, that you'd speak through me the very words that these need to hear and that you'd plant in them the very words that they need to have. And Father, that on this day you'd help us to take careful inventory of our lives, Lord, and to surrender our all to you. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. And we do it all in Christ Jesus' holy name. And to that, God's people would say, Amen. We're kind of going through Romans chapter 12, and we're talking about the spiritual gifts. These, these gifts are laid out for us here in Romans 12, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in Ephesians chapter 4, and then 1 Peter chapter 4. And I'd invite you, as you can, kind of jot those down, remember those, and and look through them and think about them, meditate on them, and see what it is that God would have you understand as your gift. But I want you to understand today, too, the great truth that we've, we've tried to explain many times. If you're born again, God has gifted you with particular gifts that He wants to use through you in a unique and glorious way that nobody else can do. God has formulated within you a glorious presence because of you being born again that nobody in this world can imitate and that only you can use fully to the glory of God. So we want you to understand that today because if you look at this verse, he talks about these gifts being differing according to the grace that is given to us. And that grace that God gave us has given us starts at salvation. But friends, here's the problem. I'm afraid a whole lot of people accepted the salvation that Jesus Christ freely and wondrously gave them and then they were unwilling to take the next step. Matter of fact, I've met way too many people that are perfectly satisfied with salvation and they don't want anything else. Now listen, this is something I believe with all my heart. When you look on the outside and look at the church of Jesus Christ today, for the most part, you don't see a whole lot of joy. You don't see a whole lot of praise and worship. You don't see a whole lot of people that are just full of the Holy Spirit and in love with Jesus and in love with one another. And I have to, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, why is that? Why is it the people that ought to be the happiest, most joy-filled people on the face of the earth, why is it that so many times we can't get along, we have factions and divisions among us? And I think that I've stumbled up on the answer to it. I told Morris, I said, me and him's going to get together and write a book. Because I really believe with all my heart the problem with the lack of joy that you see in the church of Jesus Christ today is the failure for God's people to realize that they have been gifted by God and God wants to, in that gift, do things through them and not only through them, but for them that nothing else can do. You see, God wants you to understand that whenever He made you, He made you unique, set apart, and gloriously apparelled for a particular ministry that you can do better than anybody on the face of the earth. And you've got to make sure that you grab a hold of that. You know, I've kind of likened this to the, uh, the fact, and, and I was like this as a child. My dad, until his death, he'd always talk about the fact that whenever I was a little fella, and they'd buy me something at Christmas. They'd have it under the tree and be wrapped up all pretty. And sometimes he'd come in a big old box. And whenever Christmas would come, I'd finally tear all that wrapping off and cast that wrapping over to the side. And I'd dig down in that box and I'd give all those goodies out. 
And I'd just be tickled to death there. But then guess what I'd do? You know, all the goodies were laying over here and I'd start playing with the box. Oh, I'd wear that box out. I'd wear it like a coat of armor. I know I did that once and it got tangled up around my feet and I fell into the dining room table. That didn't go over good. But I mean, I'd, I'd use that box until literally it had holes in it. It was wore out and it couldn't be used for anything anymore. It was only fit to be discarded. I'm afraid sometimes that's what we do with our salvation. We accept the salvation that only God can give us through the free grace that only God can provide. But once we accept that salvation, we're perfectly content to let that be what we deal with the rest of our lives. And friends, I want you to understand that's only the beginning of a glorious journey that God has designed for you to be a part of that you'll never know the fullness of your salvation until you're involved in it with Him to the point that you accept the gifts that He's given you, you cultivate the gifts that are within you, and you use those gifts to flow out of you to help other people see that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life and wants to be Lord of their life. Now you might be here today and you'll say something like this. You'll say, well preacher, I just don't think God's gifted me. As a matter of fact, I don't even profess to be a Christian. I don't really even know if I want anything to do with it. I've got good news for you, friend. I want you to turn back with me to Romans chapter 2. Oh, this is some, I hope that you did say that this morning because I want to show you this verse and I think by the end of the service, if you'll take this verse for what it says, I think you'll be up here saying, you know, I want to know this Jesus. Listen to what it says, Romans chapter 2 verse 4. He's speaking to a lost and dying world and he says, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness? Now wait a minute, whose goodness? Of God's goodness. Do you despise the riches of God's goodness and the forbearance that God has shown you and the long suffering that He has given you? Listen to this. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but that the goodness of God leadeth if you're here today and you're lost, what God has done in your life is do certain things and works in your life to help you know His great love for you. He's given you good things in your life so that you might repent of your sin and your worldliness and come and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. You feel God, I'm sure you feel the way you're There's been a lot of bad things happening in my life. Can I remind you that there is one on this earth who walks even in church that hates everything that God has made? You know, let me tell you something. We, we, get all, we get all tore up, and I do too, we all do. We get all tore up with the drug testing and the drug sales and all those people. Let me tell you something. They see how the world can keep the hearts to be changed with the gospel. They could be trying to do everything they want to do in our society, but if people have put their faith and trust in life in the hands of Jesus Christ, then they wouldn't have anybody to tell the garbage to, and they'd be out of business. You see? This is what the Bible teaches. There is a soul who can't do anything to our God, but can attack the children of God. And Jesus Christ be ready to pass with absolutely no defeat from God freely given to the people and the necessity to keep us safe. That's it. You know, so many times Satan comes. He comes to you on the internet. He comes to you. Even in your prayer room, he'll come to your relationship, he'll come against you or anything that he can come against you. But I just want to make sure that I remind you that the Bible says, Great is he that's in us and he is in the world. I would also like to make sure that you understand the fact that God said in his own word that when any temptation that comes that you think you can't stand up against, God has provided a way of escape. Joseph's way of escape from Potiphar's wife's ladder was to run. And sometimes we need to learn to run from the things that the devil has put out in front of us to bait and get back to the truth, to the fact that no Christ Jesus can lead from the hand. Now, we go back and we're talking about a spiritual gift. That's what I want you to understand. Even today, if you're here and you're lost, God has designed you in a very particular way, and you will never know the joy in your life that you want to know until you are formulating the gift that He has given even the lost. So that they might serve him with all the heart and faith in him. That's what the church needs to do. That's what the church needs to understand. That's what the law needs to know. Because God has designed you in a specific way. And it is glorious to know that God gives us pictures of heaven all through 
and an author of life. I mean, think about creation. That's God created Adam and Eve. He created Adam from the dust of the ground. He created Eve from the child of Adam. Well, how does God create today? He makes sure that people know that they're not in charge because it takes a man and two women to create an animation baby. It takes a man and a woman. You know, they know that you all didn't know that stuff. Things like you talk to me, you all go, and no, I'm telling you, seriously, I've studied biology and everything. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you. I thought this was just a religious way of saying, man, that's me. More than that. You see, what God wants us to do is something that that's how he accomplishes his work on this earth, the past, to the power of the Holy Spirit, the world of the human, cultivating the gifts that he's given us, and he's using those gifts to draw people to himself. Look what he says here. We're going to go over this a little bit, but then I want to take you somewhere else. But he talks about this different gift. Now, if you'll take, if you'll take 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you'll give three to those, you're going to find out. Okay? I know we went over this, but bear with me. You go to Romans chapter 12, and you take the gift three to here, and you're going to find the spell. You lay it side by side, kind of compare what's here and what's here. Then you go to Ephesians chapter 4, and you lay that in your city. And then you go to 1 Peter chapter 4, and you lay those. You say 1 Peter, conditioned it all, you build it all down, you get two years, the Christian gift and the ministry gift. Right? And here's what you need. If you'll notice, the only open way of truly through all four of those gifts is the gift of Christ. What's the cross? Well, let's go back to Romans 12. He says, having been gifts that are different according to the grace that is given to us, if this gift is prophecy, it prophesies according to the proportion of faith. Prophecy in the Old Testament was speaking to God spoke to and inspired in such a special way that they could write down the very words that God wanted a lost and dying nation called Israel to hear. He did that through the prophets of the New Testament, the apostles, and those who were associated with the apostles to write down the very truth of God that he wanted to reveal to a lost and dying world, to reveal the fact that all of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi was written about only one person, and that one person was Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus was concealed in the Old Testament and is revealed in the New Testament. So in both Testaments, he is gloriously apparelled as God of very God and Savior above all. And we've got to make sure we remember that. That's what the prophet today does. The, the work of prophecy as far as writing down, hearing from God the revelation, and writing that down for, for generations to follow it is of no more important because it's already been canonized. Everything that God wants to say has been said here. As a matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews says that God spoke in times past by the apostles and prophets, but it has his last day spoken to us by who? Remember? By Jesus Christ. And by nobody else. And that's what we need to preach. That's what the preacher does today. The prophet today who has been given the gift of prophecy is a man who stands and publicly proclaims the glorious truth of God's Word and points all the people that he's able to preach to to know about other than Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior and the answer to their greatest need. He is our God and our King and our Redeemer, and He's the one that we can talk to anybody about and realize they need Him just as much as we need Him. You see, if you've been given the gift of prophecy, then preach. Don't care where, preach. Preach in the bread cell. Go down to town and preach in the bus home. Do like Brother Tony and Don. Go out to the Haven and preach. Do what I used to do and go over to Johnson City and mission and preach. Preach wherever you have an opportunity. You say, well, I'm not being given opportunities. Maybe it's because you're getting open your mouth. Maybe the opportunity is, well, let me tell you something. Man, the best I can tell, God's pleased with them when they preach on the street. God's pleased with them when they preach in the cafeteria. God's pleased with them whenever they'll listen to the culture around them and turn everything toward the truth that they need to hear from God's holy word about God's holy son that can't be delivered other than any way from the, that by God's holy spirit who is working within you and giving you a desire to preach. If you can go to the church of prophecy, then prophesy, preach. It, it's also stated in Acts that just the one who publicly proclaims to preach the glorious truth of God. So what else does he say? He talks about prophecy. He talks about uh, ministry. Let's wait on our ministry. I mean, 
that that sentence is greatly needed. I hope you realize that. People that are just willing to minister to others in the name of Jesus. They're kind of looking for opportunities all through the church to minister in His name. They might be somebody with a great need and make an opportunity to minister to group and minister to body and help with in that great need. It might be ministry that can be any one of thousands of areas that are available if we all do good. That's what He's for us. He's a gift that God gives us. Uh, not only ministry opportunities, but teaching opportunities. Now, what's the difference between a preacher and a teacher? Well, a preacher will just stand and publicly proclaim the Word of God. A teacher will get out with groups and individuals, you know, systematize the things that they want to, to, to teach or to know. They'll lay these things out and show you verse by verse by verse what it means to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. How do we know that Jesus Christ is our God? How do we know the Holy Spirit is coming to dwell within anybody who will call on the name of Jesus? And how do we know that He abides there and will never, ever go away? Well, that's what the teacher will do is take the time. And you know, you say, well, that sounds a lot like preaching. Yes, listen, if you're preaching, you better be teaching. You better be letting somebody understand you on a deeper level what it is you believe and what it is that you're preaching. So if you're teaching, just like I said last time, listen, when you're teaching, you ought to break into a little preaching there, man. I mean, seriously, I've seen these people talk about God's Word, all they've got is what they can read out of the quarterly, and all they know is what somebody looked down in the quarterly to say. Let me tell you something, if you're really a teacher, if you've been given the gift of teaching, then I mean, your teaching's going to turn into proclamation. You're going to be full of the power of God's Holy Spirit. You're going to begin to teach like you've never taught before. And the reason is, is God's using you at that time, not in your own power, but in Jesus. You've got yourself to the place of not trusting in your faith, of your wisdom, and your knowledge, and your spirit on the back of you. But by the way, he can teach you what they do to y'all to teach. So you just make sure that I hear the truth. He can see it. Oh, if you see, you just keep going through this. What, uh, teaching, what about what other gift is available here? Now, what about education? And I talked about this last time. Maybe it's just useful for me to say it again. There are two kinds of people in God's church. There's the person who wants to see them take. And there's this person. You don't say that out loud. Oh, okay. Well, sometimes you just think a little bit too hard for your mind to contain. You know what I'm saying? No, it's nothing to get tired of. It's just that sometimes you need some relief. You know what I'm saying? No, I feel like, let me tell you something, honey. If you're a discouraging spirit, I mean, just, just make a decision today to stop. And stop being an encourager. Stop being a person who lifts up his up rather than turning people down. I'll just get some different things to do. Well, guess what? I don't need it. But as long as I'm preaching God's Word and preaching from God's Word and pointing you to the Word of God, then it's probably pretty good preaching if you just listen. You see, there are people that need encouragement. There are people that need lifting up. And the best I can tell, there's nobody on the face of the earth that really needs to be torn down. Right? Even people that are high and mighty and all things, they don't need to be torn down. They just need to be instructed. They need to be encouraged. They need to have somebody point them to the right way, and that way is a narrow way, and that way is only one Jesus life. And that's all they need. Friends, that's what we need to be. We need to be people who encourage, who exhort, who lift people up and point them to the right way and encourage them to do And it's a gift. It's a spiritual gift that God has laid within you and wants to bring out of you to help other people. What's that one to do? It doesn't do it in two places. That's all it needs to be said. The bad thing is, I know a lot of people give, and the only thing they ever want anybody to do is pay their gift. Friends, listen. This is biblical. I mean, you can take this to the bank. If you have a concern in your giving to make sure that somebody knows that you're giving, then your giving is useless. You won't have any reward at all for it. The only reward you get will be from that person that said, Oh, what a wonderful gift you got from the people. We all need to pay to have a chance. Isn't that it? Friends, listen, giving ought to flow out the heart of the 
that we can learn from Jesus. That's why we're here. And that's the reason we're here. And that's the glory. This is just not for anybody to brag on. This is to know that we can get to all the people that are going to come. I have thought that we can do it here. And we can go back and pray for people like me. But if we can do it, do it with the same thing. I can do it. We will do it. That means we can do it with the same thing. And I'm so thankful that we've got people that do this. To do it in prison, to do it very well. So, by the way, this has absolutely nothing to do with what you know that? Some of the greatest sacrificial gifts that I have ever had in my life have been some of the poorest things that I have ever known. But the gifts and the blood of Jesus Christ and the church. I mean, may God and I bless this day to death. Not only that, but look, you can do it with Billy. Those are the people that have the overseas church that they're, they're doing. Not only church work, but business work. The people around. You know, you, you, you know people that are entrepreneurial in, uh, in many ways. They can make a business. They can run a business. And whenever they do that, they need to do it. It's not just this business. It's just all of life. In other words, whenever you have anything to do, do it with Billy. If you're over a Sunday school class, do it with Billy. If you're over a a church, do it kills you. You're over a business, do it kills you. Do everything you do as you're doing it under me. The Bible says do it as if you're doing it under the Lord. Do your business, do your life, do everything in your home as if you were doing that very thing for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it is. It's so amazing. Do it spiritually. We talked about that last time. It's just for me. It's just for me. We want to do that. When you try to cheer somebody up, don't you see it all the time. You can't handle it. No, I, I'm serious. I mean, listen, there's been people that tell me, you know, trying to, trying to, I, I think they were trying to show me mercy, but boy, before they were gone, I was trying to sleep, but I'm about to die. You know, you get to see yourself about halfway through the place, you're praying, you're saying, Lord, this would be a great time for the Lord. I mean, Lord, get me out. I mean, kill me, Lord. I mean, I'm going to heaven. This would be fine. Just get me out of this situation. Free grace, and you're showing mercy to somebody. They were joyful. They were cheerful. They were happy. I mean, they were happy countenance. You say, well, I just don't feel that way. Well, then don't try to show mercy right there. You see, get to the place of knowing that your mercy flows from a God who's given you a great joy. That's the people. We need to show mercy to these people, you know, that, that we, we see that are on all these drugs, all these problems, all these issues, all these things in life. Let me tell you something. They need mercy. They don't need people like me and people like you standing in the face and telling them how sorry they are because they got themselves in that position. They need people to lift them up. They need encouragers to stand beside them. They need prophets to proclaim the word of God. They need teachers to show them the way to walk. They need all of these gifts to be manifested through the church and through the individuals of the church for their betterment. For betterment is to be Do something. We've got to make sure we do things. There's a whole lot of, of uh, these uh, that are called spiritual gift inventories you can take. Every church is given them. Every church has them on file. And you can take those, and they are very good indicators of the particular area that God is, is most gifted you to be used in. But let me tell you what you need to do more than anything. Get your nose in God's Word and get your heart right before Jesus and ask Him through the power of the Holy Spirit to help you understand what it is that He has gifted you to do and to help you to do that very thing to His glory. That's the one, that's who you need to point out your particular gift. I talked to that fellow one day, it's been about four or five years ago, but he was telling me his call to ministry. And he said that the call to ministry was, was proven to him one day whenever. A particular church didn't have a pastor, and one of the elders of that church came to him and said, Brother, I believe you'd make a good pastor over there. And he said, You know, right there, I've got to think that, you know, I believe I should. That's the dumbest call of ministry I ever heard in my life. Somebody else told you that you were supposed to be the pastor of God's church? I don't think so. And by the way, it pretty much played out to where that what God has taught me to do. You need to know what God told you to do. Sure, you ought to have people around you that will clearly listen to you and watch you and help you. And, I mean, you know, there's just a whole lot of things I'm not good to do. And I know I'm not good to do. But there's a whole lot of things God's put in my heart to do. And those are the things 
that God has given you to the way. You say, well, preacher, I'm not going to hear a hard time saying that I've lost my spiritual gift either. Well, your spiritual gift is pretty much just who you are. If God working through you to accomplish great things, what we risk are are to teach us the things that need to be done to God's holy church so that we might realize that sometimes we've got the gift and we're not doing anything with them. If God wants us to understand, friends, that He wants to use that in glorious way to increase His kingdom and encourage His church and help those who are made to know. The gifts are very important for our joy, for the benefit of the church, for the work that God gives us to do. I mean, listen, if you're not, if you're not working for being your gift you're going to be most frustrated with anything you're trying to do. But if you are working with your gift you are going to find joy in the You're going to look forward to the things that God gives you to do. You're not going to back away from the more things that God gives you opportunity to do because you are being used gloriously by God in that giftedness that He's given you that nobody else can give you. And He speaks things to you that He won't do to anybody else. That's why the church is called the body. That's why we're bound together in that glorious way of finding. That's why, listen, when you're laying out all the time, you're hurting the church of Jesus Christ. You're not just hurting yourself. You're hurting the church of Jesus Christ. When you're not, listen, you can lay up and be here the Now hang on that a minute to see if you can get to be No, that's a fact. You can be here every time. You can be laying plumb out. Because if you're not doing what God has called you to do and gifted you to do in the place He's called you to do it, then you might as well be at home watching over it. I wouldn't recommend that for anybody. <laughs> These gifts are so different and so glorious that God wants to use you, has you, anybody, in the church, to do what nobody else can do. Now, I want you to look at something with me right here. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. There is a real danger to forgive you that God has granted you. Save the lost, matters not. There's a danger because if you're not doing what God has called you to do, then you are in rebellion against the very God who created you. And all that, there is no reason. Now listen to me. This is uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. First of all, for we're traveling through this, you need to understand this. When you read talent, most, a lot of people think talent they talk about personal ability. It has absolutely nothing to do with personal ability. This is not your talent like as in your talent to think or your talent to, uh, to anything. It's not about your personal ability. The talent here is the old English way of talking about a unit that measures a weight in particular, and it's about a manuscript. It's about a granting of a gift to three different people. Okay? That's what I want you to notice. That don't, don't get caught up in the old English word talent. Just understand that what's given here is a gift, and could I just say it's plain, of a great value. And it's given for a Nobody else can accomplish it except these three people. And here it is. Chapter 25 of Matthew, verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus speaking, by the way, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who calls his own service and delivered unto them his kids. And unto one he gave five pounds, five measures of money, to another two and to another one, to every man according to his several ability in such ways he took his journey. Then he would have received the five pounds from him and traded with the same and made him over five pounds. He made five more pounds for the five pounds that he had given. Likewise, he would have received two, but he gained also another two. But he that received one went and did them good and filled his Lord's name. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and reckoned with them. And so he would have received five pounds came and brought other five pounds, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five pounds. Behold. I have gained beside these five pounds more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
Thou must be faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And listen to this. He also that he received two things. Cain said, Lord, thou delivered to me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside those. The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Listen to this. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art hard man. Reaching where thou hast not sought, gathering where thou hast not sought. And I was afraid and went and hid thy town in the earth, lo, thou hast been sent. The Lord answered and said unto him, Wicked and slothful servant, ye knew that I reached where I sowed not, and gathered where I had not sought. You ought therefore to have put my money to the exchanger, and then at my time I should have received my money. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him who has ten talents. For every one that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but the one that has not shall be taken away in the next that he has. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, and shall be used this is kind of one of the most controversial things in all of Scripture, because some have erroneously passed this off as a statement that God has taught that you can lose your salvation. You think that can be part of the church. This is talking about the kingdom. This is talking about the time of eternity. This is talking about the fact that to every person who has ever been born, God has gifted them in some glorious and wonderful ways. Again, if you go back to Romans chapter 2, and God says to his prophets, inspired by the Holy Spirit, do you not know that the goodness that I've shown you, I showed you to lead you to repent of your sins and to trust in me? That's what it's all about. It's all about drawing people to Jesus Christ. These three people were given a sum of money, glorious gifts, gifts from the hand of the Lord of the country, and was given to them in a way that might be a free gift. And he gave them a, not only a gift, but a stewardship over those gifts. And the first two received them well and did well with the things that, that the, the uh, overseer of the country did. Please listen. Today, God wants us to understand this spirit, this, this thing of salvation, and this thing of being part of the church of Jesus Christ and of the kingdom that will last throughout eternity. God wants us to use the gifts that He's given us and to be good stewards over everything that God has given us and has gifted us with so that people around us might be touched with the gospel and we might be the very messages that God uses to not only touch their lives but to draw their lives into the body of Christ Jesus our Lord. And those who refuse to do what God has called them to do, and by the way, you know, even your lives are distributed. It is God's giving you a time to make those. I don't know how long it is. I mean, I've known people that have lived, uh, I think, for a long time, maybe four years old since he passed away. But I had a friend who was a world class athlete who passed away at 29. I don't know how long I've got on this thing. But what time I have has been given to me as a gift from the hand of God, the Lord over all the land that I walk on. And it's been given to me as a gift with a stewardship of that spirit. And God wants me to understand that, listen, and this is the fact, everything that I have in heaven is contingent upon what I do with what He's given me down here. Did you know that? You say, well, preacher, what do you get there? He's proud of it. I mean, this is as clear as clear can be. Look what happens whenever He takes that one talent that that slothful servant took and hid in the ground and went uncovered and tried to say, well, here, I'm giving back what you need, Lord. Well, I'm dressing you well. I, you, so you think that you're not going to give back what already belongs to the Lord? Well, sure, you're always going to give that back. He thought he was doing something. I hid it in the ground. I took it from going away. And I gave it back to you, Lord. No, no, that's what happened. It, he says to probably be the end of time to be the end of the day. Take therefore, verse 28, take the talent from him and give it unto him who has, what's it say? Ten talents. Now, 
argument. I thought the guy just had five talents. He said, Give five by the Lord of the nations. He's made five. I'm doing well with him. But now we see that he's still got two. James, I'm telling you, everything that you have in heaven, and by the way, heaven's real. Heaven's more real than the earth. And I can pray that with, with, without backing up any extreme case something. One day this earth and all these stars and everything we see, it's going to be folded up, put away as a judgment that judges the world. And it's going to be put away. And it's going to be no more. And it's going to be in heaven. And it's going to be a new earth and a new world where it dwells righteously. And right in the middle of that, I'm going to be. And I'm going to be in heaven. 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 I'm going to have me a mansion to tell by the hand of God. It's already got my name on the mailbox that he's doing some improvements to it every day that I use what he's given me in the way that brings me glory. That's what Jesus is doing. But you've got to understand, this is why it's so important. It's so important to find what you give to you and to use your gift for the glory of God. You know, you say, well, preacher, you're not being much of a story. You're not being much of a story. I'll tell you what. If you'll take what's said today and you'll start trying to examine your life and you'll try to find out what it is that God has given you to do and what the gifts of the Spirit are within your life, and then you'll begin to act on those with a, in a way that brings in glory, then you'll say, boy, that preacher's told me. Because you see, nothing that I preach will ever encourage you until you take it and apply it to your life and let it begin to be part of who you are. That's what the Bible does. It gets, it's not just something to go to you, it's something to get to the point. And that's what the preaching of God's Word ought to be. This, this parable of the talents is talking about nothing other than the use of the gifts God gives. Those glorious gifts of the Spirit that God has placed in you. The next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the gifts for the we're going to be talking about the transitory gifts that have to solve the gifts that have passed away. We're going to be talking about the gifts that are still available today, why they're still available, why we believe they're still available, why we believe they're not available today. And we're going to make sure that at least the church here is the place that God wants to use in this way so we can't use anybody else's place. Because it's not the time for anybody else's place. You can't go through down these rules. You can't go through these rules. In both Corinthians and Romans and Ephesians and both Peter, you can't go down the and pick the and say, Well, I think that's not good. I don't believe that's good. No, let me tell you what it is. It's a working that only God can do. Maybe, probably, most of the time, the end of this is given in different proportions to you so that you might accomplish great things for the kingdom in that very particular area that He's designed you to serve. I mean, I'm glad that everybody's not a preacher. I really am. I'd be out of the job. Right? I mean, I wouldn't get sick. I, you know, I'm glad everybody's not a teacher because everybody that's a teacher, you never would be out of the same school. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. I, really, I know sometimes you might not think that way, but I'll tell you that. What the old preacher used to say, you never need to say, you need to know that God is good. This church is the revival in that past. And I don't think this church should see revival until it happens. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time you've been in the world. Lord, I do pray that we preach here in the next week to that gift. Lord, we preach to you and 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 to you. But if you do to the fact that let the exercise the gifts you give, we don't deserve the blessing. But Lord, with all your blessing is so much, we know you want us to do that. And Lord, we know that you want to draw us closer to you so that we might have to do the exercise the gifts that you give to each one of us. So Father, you have to make sure that you just think how you're thinking about the gifts. Listen to you, Lord, and speak to us through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the word. Father, it's not to spend great time in prayer. It's spending time with you and asking the people to express us in the way that you have to do. And Father, you help every day to be a glory to your history and try to stay with you. Fill us, Lord, with your power, with your grace, and with your glory. And help us every day to be the same as you are in Jesus. And I pray for us like that. Father,